So welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to your weekly city seminar series. Today we're very lucky to have Rainu Malhotra, who's come across to us from the University of Arizona. And today she's going to be talking to, to us about uh, Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. Uh, Rainu did a uh, master's in physics at the Indian Institute of Technology uh, and then came across to Cornell for her PhD work uh, and then did her postdoc at uh, Caltech. Uh, following that, he, she spent a, a decade at uh, the Lunar and Planetary Institute in uh, Houston. Uh, and then in 2000, she moved to the University of Arizona where she was uh, appointed a professor in 2004. And in 2011, she took up the chair of the theoretical astrophysics group there. Um, and she was uh, awarded the URI Prize of the Division of Planetary Sciences in 1997. And just in April, she was uh, elected to uh, the AAAS and also the National Academy of Sciences. Um, <coughs> her work has revolved around uh, orbital dynamics, in particular uh, orbital resonances in the solar nebula, uh, planet migration and uh, deformation and depletion of the asteroid belt, uh, cha chaotic planet migration, uh, and of course the origin of uh, Pluto's uh, eccentric orbit uh, and uh, the implications for the Kuiper belt, which she's uh, certainly going to be talking about today in her talk. So please join me in welcoming Ray New. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. This is. Uh this is a great audience to be talking to this week. Uh, it's been an exciting week. Um, by way of introduction, let me uh, say that the kinds of things I do are not done in the lab. They're not done in uh, big space missions. Um, my tool is mainly mathematics and pencil and paper and sometimes a computer or two. Yeah, people like me would have been uh, tracking the motions of, uh, of, of planets in the sky in the, against the background stars and uh, calculating where they would be in the future and uh, sometimes uh, scaring the natives with uh, predictions of uh, lunar and solar eclipses and so on. Um, but starting, in, uh, starting with Kepler, when uh, Kepler identified the laws, the laws of motion for the planets, the the laws of uh, planetary motion. And then uh, Isaac Newton, who laid out the law of gravity. Um, we can ask other questions. We now know how planets move. They move in uh, elliptical orbits under the, the action of a 1 over r squared uh, law of force. Uh, we can go on to asking questions like, uh, how did the planets come about in these particular arrangements? And I've been lucky to live in a time where we have some partial answers to these questions, um, why, how the planetary configuration came to be, why the, the orbits are the way they are, why the space is empty in between the planetary orbits. And so today, some of, the, some of these questions will be answered. Uh, our story is still incomplete. And I've made some leaps of faith to fill out the gaps. And some of you will catch those, and some of you might not catch those, but ask me at any time. Um, so today it's about Pluto and the Kuiper Belt and uh, what these have to do with our understanding of planetary systems. And the bottom line, I can tell you right at the, at the beginning, is that Pluto is what I think of as the smoking gun for some dramatic event that took place in the early history of the solar system and that shaped the solar system uh, as we know it today. So here's a little more detail on that storyline. The solar system has not always looked like it does now. It's at an age of four and a half giga years. Uh, and about that time, at the beginning, at four and a half giga years ago, we think, we figured out that the orbits of the planets were more compact. Plus, there was a lot of small debris, small planets, and uh, planet, what we think of as planetesimals hanging around. The leftovers of those are what we see as asteroids and comets now. And a few hundred million years after the solar system got started, so roughly around 3.9, 4 giga years ago, this debris cleared up, mostly cleared up. So we have a little bit still left, teasing us, telling us that there, oh, we used to be here. There were more of us back then. And uh, the planets, during this uh, clearing up and this, uh, uh, this process of clearing up the debris, the planets settled into their present orbits. Uh, it was accompanied by this period of um, 
heavy bombardment we, um, or great upheaval. It was a dramatic event. Uh, the planetary re rearrangements probably did not happen very, very smoothly. There were significant instabilities. But now, at, at the end of that e event, the orbits uh, ended up roughly, or very close to where, we, where they are today, in the stable <coughs> orbital configuration. Um, there was a heavy meteoroidal bombardment that, that accompanied this. Uh, possibly, and this is quite speculative, uh, possibly some of that was quite crucial for life on Earth. There were materials that rained down on Earth during this bombardment that are now incorporated in, um, in the biosphere. Uh, there was very little, uh, there is very little asteroidal and cometary debris left now. And so that's why we enjoy a relatively low impact flux. We still get meteorites hitting the Earth, but at, at a far lower rate than was happening in the first few hundred million years of solar system history. And, um, and I'll explain, most of my talk is going to be explaining how Pluto's peculiar orbit is uh, one smoking gun of this event. And we have more evidence in the asteroid belt as well as uh, close by in, at, the, at the moon, uh, the craters that we see on the moon. So let's start with Pluto. Pluto was discovered in 1930 by um, Clyde Tombaugh. Uh, in northern Arizona at Lowell, at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff. There is a young Clyde Tombaugh there with his telescope. And this was uh, the pair of discovery images where you can see Pluto is conveniently pointed by that arrow. <laughs> this is, it was a faint moving spot that uh, Tombaugh recognized as a new planet that had not been known before. Um, since then, Pluto has come into focus with just this week. <laughs> we see, we now see these, uh, these beautiful images that have come back to us from New Horizons. Uh, and uh, here's the latest global almost true color image. So Pluto is a small planet. Anybody find this familiar? It's a reddish <laughs> planet. Where, what's the other red planet in our solar system? There's Mars. It kind of looks like Mars even. Uh, if we didn't know the scale, we might well uh, confuse it with Mars. It has geology, it has craters, it has mountains, it has plains, and it's not alone. Uh, Pluto's large moon, Charon, was discovered in 1970. This is an image from uh, New Horizons from this week. Incidentally, please let me know if, I'm, uh, if the volume is wrong. Um, sometimes I shout too much and it gets too uncomfortable. Right, so Pluto was known, uh, known to be accompanied by this large moon, Charon, which is roughly half its own size. Uh, and uh, this is this uh, uh, single image of both these bodies in the, in the single image that we got just a few days ago. Uh, in back about 10 years ago, there were two more moons of, uh, of Pluto that were discovered using the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, some six years later, there was another one, Kerberos. You can see that on the... Um, uh, on the right over there in that image. This is a Hubble Space, uh, Hubble Space Telescope image. And then another one named uh, Styx that was discovered just in 2012. And so Pluto has a total of five moons that we know of. Um, and uh, let's see, they are, Charon, as I said, is about half Pluto's size. And uh, the other four are smaller moons. They have diameters uh, about 30 kilometers across, which is probably comparable to the size of the Bay Area population. So they're about that wide. Um, their orbital periods range from about a week for Charon, which is the closest moon, and uh, uh, going up to about um, oh, five weeks or so for uh, Hydra, the outermost one. Uh, here's uh, the trajectory of New Horizons as, we, as it left Earth and practically shot all the way across to Pluto in almost a straight line. On the way, it had a gravitational assist from Jupiter, right about uh, there. There's Jupiter's orbit. And then it was a, almost a straight line path to Pluto. Now, here's, uh, this is kind of interesting, that the Pluto moon system is nearly flat. It's very, very flat. And its mean plane is uh, tipped almost 90 degrees to the plane of the solar system. So it presents more or less a target, a straight target 
for our projectiles that go by it. There's even more company for Pluto. Starting in 1990, so this is, a, this is an animation that was created by Alex Parker. Uh, here in, back in 1990, uh, actually, yes, this is, he's starting off his counter here at 1990. Pluto and Charon were the only two objects we knew in this outer solar system near and beyond uh, Neptune's orbit. And uh, uh, the first Kuiper belt, what we think of now as the Kuiper belt, which is this belt of anal analogous to the asteroid belt. This is a belt of small bodies orbiting the sun just beyond Neptune's orbit. We started discovering uh, Kuiper belt objects. And each of these, uh, you can follow the counter there. Each, as each dot appears, that's when it was discovered. Uh, we now have, um, we know, or we have discovered more than 1,300 Kuiper belt objects. Um, most remain to be discovered. There are hundreds of thousands of similar sized objects that we've we already know that we haven't yet discovered. Um, they, uh, you can see they're kind of puffed up. There are some big ones. The Pluto is, these are more or less uh, in uh, relative size. The, the sizes of the dots represent the relative sizes of these objects, or brightnesses actually. So Pluto is uh, amongst the biggest ones. Uh, now, the small bodies of the solar system are very interesting to planetary scientists because they are leftovers of the building blocks of our solar system. We study them, we st their properties and their distribution in space provide clues to the formation and development of the solar system, and you'll see more of this story um, emerging by the end of this hour. They have impacted, they have hit the surfaces of the planet. So they're a potential hazard to mankind. They're also a space resource. When hopefully mankind is spacefaring, we can uh, hopefully we, we can possibly use these small bodies as a resource for things we need to travel in space. Okay, so stepping back, the architecture of the solar system, I think of it as having four or five distinct neighborhoods. Um, we live right here in this very this is distance going away from the sun now. And Earth is right about there. The distance uh, from, uh, from the sun to the Earth is, about, is, is a little less than 100 million miles. Um, these are the big planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, at five times Earth's distance, 10 times, 20 times, and about 30 times. And the Kuiper belt lies just beyond Neptune, going out to roughly twice Neptune's distance. It kind of, it seems like it peters out about twice Neptune's distance. Um, the small bodies, uh, so I think of this, these neighborhoods as the inner solar system, the outer solar system starting from about Jupiter. So the inner solar system has this complement of small bodies, the asteroid belt, the outer solar system has this complement, um, uh, the Kuiper belt, and there are some stragglers in between. In the inner space we have near Earth asteroids, or asteroids that cross the Earth's orbit, the orbits of the inner planets. In the outer solar system, we have these stragglers that we call centaurs that we think are being fed in. They drift in from the, from the Kuiper belt, and they bounce around here for short periods of time before they get removed by various processes. Um, and then way out, there's another very large um, population of small bodies called the Oort cloud which surrounds the solar system in a spherical cloud, more or less spherical cloud, at distances which are roughly halfway to the nearest stars. Uh, we tend to not think of that because it's really far away. It's like the attic of the solar system where many of these small bodies were thrown out and still live undisturbed for long times. Um, but they are actually quite connected to what we'll, what we'll see today to these uh, small body populations that are closer in. Um, here is an artist's rendition of what the solar system might look like from um, maybe two or three hundred times the Earth's distance from the sun. So looking out, the, the Kuiper belt would be the largest structure. The Kuiper belt also has a lot of dust that's created during collisions and uh, sputtering off of uh, these larger bodies. And so visually, it would actually be quite, quite possibly the brightest structure in the solar system if you were looking at it far, from far away. And Pluto's orbit, you can see, um, 
uh, it's emphasized here. It's not the only orbit that looks like this, but it is. Uh, uh, we've known we've known it best. We've known it for the longest time. The it's it really straddles the width of the Kuiper belt. It's uh, closest distance to the sun. Pluto comes closest to the sun, somewhere near the edge, the inner edge of the Kuiper belt, and goes farthest out near the outer edge of the Kuiper belt. And so Pluto is possibly, almost certainly, is, if Mark is here, he probably has the latest, is possibly the largest member of the Kuiper belt, as we know today. Um, Pluto has this peculiar orbit we've known about. It kind of sticks out of the mean plane of the planets. It's tilted some 17 degrees to the mean plane of the solar system. And a couple of other parameters that we use to measure orbits, um, the size of the orbit, so orbits are, of course, elliptical. Kepler taught us that hundreds of years ago. Um, the size and uh, uh, shape of, of an elliptical orbit is defined by two parameters. One is the uh, half of the, the longest diameter of the orbit. is called the semi-major axis. And so this is also the average distance from the sun. So this is half of the longest diameter. So Earth's, as I said, is about uh, 93 million miles, and we also call it a unit of distance, one astronomical unit. I'll be throwing that astronomical unit around a few times in this talk. Uh, the ellipticity, how squished the orbit is, is measured by this quantity called eccentricity. And so this measures the outer roundness. And Earth's eccentricity is very tiny. It's only about 1%, 0.01. Pluto is um, much more eccentric. So a circle is zero eccentricity, a very, very elliptical orbit has eccentricity close to one. Uh, Pluto is somewhere in here at, at about 25% eccentricity. So between this circle that you see and this ellipse of 40% eccentricity. So somewhere in the middle there is how squished Pluto is. So we, we think of well, Pluto is eccentric. Uh, it's, it's orb if you look at it sideways um, relative to the mean plane of the solar system, its orbit looks like this. It's tilted. And then a top-down view, um, for scale, we have Neptune's orbit, which is pretty circular. Neptune's orbit, uh, its eccentricity is also sort of like Earth's. It's about 1%. And Pluto's is not. Pluto is much more elliptical. When it's closest to the sun, it's uh, somewhat inside, closer to the sun than Neptune is. And when it's farthest, it's, uh, so it's, it's perihelion is the closest distance, is inside Neptune. And aphelion is uh, almost uh, twice as far away as uh, Neptune is from the sun. So given that its orbit crosses Neptune's orbit, when it was first discovered and its orbit was figured out, the initial speculations were um, possibly that Pluto was an escaped moon of Neptune because its orbit crosses Neptune. Maybe sometime in the past, it actually used to orbit Neptune and somehow escaped. Uh, that idea has fallen out of favor for a number of uh, reasons, uh, primarily that the physics doesn't, it's very hard to work out the physics of uh, an event or, or a process like that. Uh, so even though it crosses Neptune's orbit, it does not ever collide with Neptune. And the reason is that Pluto is in this orbital resonance with Neptune. Pluto completes two turns around the sun for every three turns that uh, Neptune does. And uh, the geometry of that uh, resonance is that uh, whenever Pluto is inside <coughs> Neptune's orbit, Neptune is somewhere else in its orbit. So Neptune avoids, or Pluto avoids, uh, ever getting close to ne Neptune's longitude. Uh, a good way to grasp that is to look in the rotating frame, uh, rotating with uh, Neptune. So imagine a merry-go-round that's spinning at the rate that Neptune goes around the sun. Uh, in this merry-go-round, Neptune would be nearly stationary, and Pluto would carve out this or trace out this path. So it goes from uh, its farthest distance from the sun, somewhere along the line of uh, sun and Neptune. That's Pluto's aphelion. Goes through perihelion when it's almost 90 degrees away from where Neptune is. Goes back to aphelion perihelion again, and it lines up again with Neptune when it's close to its aphelion distance. So it avoids Neptune like this. And over long times, this perihelion drifts back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, like so. Okay, so this, is a, this has a period of, this is all calculated uh, um, 
mathematically given its uh, or orbit and uh, <coughs> given its orbital parameters and uh, the gravitational influence of all the planets. Um, Pluto's perihelion oscillates, we call this a libration, it's sort of like a pendulum libration. It never drifts closer to Neptune than about oh, 60 degrees or so. Okay, so it, it, it never actually gets terrible. It actually gets closer to Uranus in physical distance than it ever does to, uh, to Neptune. Now, these orbital resonances are really fascinating to, math to mathematical planetary scientists. Okay. How, what are these resonances? Well, an orbital resonance arises fundamentally from gravity. Uh, gravitational mass, we know, warps space. Einstein taught us that. This is a very common way that we visualize the warping of space under, the, under uh, uh, gravity of a mass. Um, actually, this is kind of uh, analogous to toys you might see in, um, in the mall. Uh, I don't know if malls around here in Arizona, they're very popular, these, uh, these toys that have um, uh, uh, a depression in the middle, and you toss a coin, it spins around, and if you toss the coin uh, slowly enough, eventually it, um, it spins around and goes into that black hole in the center. Uh, if you give it too much angular momentum, your coin avoids getting in there, and it uh, simply skims off the other edge. And comets, for example, follow orbits like that around the sun. They don't uh, spin around uh, very closely. They follow these very, very um, uh, um, uh, fast orbits that uh, skim off uh, of the inner solar system. Um, now, when you have more than one um, planetary mass warping space, you have the gravity of many planets in the solar system superposed on each other. These, uh, the gravity of many planets create what we can think of as waves in space. Okay, so, these, so space has this very complicated structure in a planetary system with multiple planets, and it allows for many interesting types of orbits. Uh, and orbital resonance is one of these waves in space. So uh, the interesting thing about that is we can't actually see them. Uh, they're not visual objects. But small bodies can trace these structures. How the small bodies' orbits are distributed can trace these structures in, uh, in space. And uh, you can think of that like uh, flotsam tracing the wreck of a ship on the ocean. So over time, um, the wreckage will float away. And you can then trace um, the ocean, the, the flow of water by following pieces of uh, wreckage in the ocean. So small bodies are a little bit analogous to that. Their orbit distribution traces these uh, shapes, these uh, structures in space. Um, now, so if you look at the orbital distribution in the Kuiper belt, these 1,300 or so Kuiper belt objects that we have discovered so far, uh, we, we measure the semi-major axis I described to you, the size of the orbit and how elliptical they are, the eccentricities. So here's a circular orbit, and these are more and more eccentric orbits as we go upwards. Uh, each dot here is one Kuiper belt object that we've discovered. So I put it on this plot, and you can see that they're not smoothly distributed in this space. If the Kuiper belt were uh, all uh, mostly circular orbits, smoothly at bigger and bigger distances, uniform distribution of orbital sizes, we would expect a straight line or more or less flat distribution here going outward from Neptune's orbit. And the Neptune is right at 30 astronomical units, so this is measured in astronomical units. Neptune is 30 times away from, uh, from the sun as Earth is, so Earth is way out here, um, or the sun is way out here. And here's Neptune's orbit at zero, nearly zero eccentricity, a circular orbit. And uh, each of these um, KBOs, Kuiper belt objects, uh, we find lots of eccentric and resonant orbits. Okay, so there are clumps. At these, I've marked these resonances. This is a one-to-one, -one where the orbital period is equal to Neptune's orbital period. Uh, here's the three-to-two resonance, like Pluto does. Um, uh, Pluto goes around twice, while Neptune goes around three times. Here's two-to-one, uh, where the Kuiper belt object will go around once, while Neptune goes around twice. And we see these, um, these structures in this orbital parameter space. Um, uh, the, this big clump at the 3 to 2 resonance uh, is, is uh, informally called the Plutinos, the little Plutos that share uh, the characteristics of Pluto's orbit. 
And so uh, this was kind of surprising, um, not totally unexpected though, uh, but we can ask this question, why are these Kuiper belt objects piled up in eccentric resonant orbits? Same question for Pluto. Why is Pluto in that eccentric resonant orbit? The problem is that it's not possible to grow planets in eccentric orbits. Okay, when, when you have many objects uh, in eccentric orbits, they, when they collide, when they come together, they hit each other with very high velocity. And they tend to shatter rather than uh, grow bigger. So, um, so they must have formed in nearly circular orbits where the relative velocities when they hit each other are small and they can uh, accrete, coalesce. Um, so uh, the newer theory, for, as I said, with the, when Pluto was first discovered, the speculation was that it might have been a moon of Neptune that had escaped. Uh, the newer theory is that Nept the, to explain this high concentration of these resonant eccentric orbits uh, is that Neptune migrated outward and it shepherded through its gravity many Kuiper belt objects into these eccentric resonant orbits. Uh, so how does that work? Okay, so this is called planet migration theory and it seems almost uh, uh, crazy to be thinking about you know, explaining these small little objects. You know, they're really small. Pluto is a, a minor planet, um, a dwarf planet or a minor planet. Neptune is a big planet. Uh, and to try to explain the distribution of these very small bodies by moving big planets around seems a little backwards. Okay, so it's like the, the, do the tail wagging the dog. Um, so, well, why, does, why is this a natural explanation now? Uh, the reason is that as, when the planets, or the logic behind this is as the planets uh, formed, there was a lot of debris in these small bodies left over and the planets scattered this leftovers, <laughs> the left, these planetesimals, the leftovers of planet formation, which spread all the way in between the planets. And mostly a lot of mass was beyond where the giant planets were, where there was not enough time to coalesce these into bigger planets. Um, uh, so this, there was a lot of scattering that the gravity of the planets um, uh, did on these leftovers. And during the scattering, the exchange of energy and angular momentum and clearing up that debris naturally made the planets spread outwards. Okay, so we think that the planets actually started out in a more compact configuration. And this, uh, in the process of clearing up the leftovers, the planets themselves moved away from each other. Jupiter moved inward a little bit. And the other planets, the other Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, drifted outward. And I'll show you a little animation of uh, uh, how this went about. And uh, part of this, this process was also creating this uh, attic of the, of the solar system, the Oort cloud. In the, scattering, in, the in the process of scattering these small bodies, some of these were uh, removed and uh, uh, placed in the, in the Oort cloud. So here's an animation of the physics of this. So I'm going to do this only with two planets. And uh, they're illustrated with an inner planet, which is, which is Jupiter, and an outer planet, which is uh, Neptune. And imagine there's an asteroid or a Kuiper belt object that comes along and uh, has a gravitational slingshot with Neptune. And uh, it has the, it can, it can be scattered inward. It can take away energy from Neptune or give energy to Neptune. And this particular one loses energy and gets scattered inward and subsequently has an encounter, a slingshot with uh, Jupiter. And Jupiter is so big that it typically, on average, it more often uh, gives more energy to these uh, Kuiper belt objects or any, any small bodies that come by. It gives them so much energy that they get scattered to very large, high energy or high or big orbits. So they get scattered outward. On average, then, this is, this is what happens. Most of the mass that's left over is, is beyond the orbit of uh, Neptune at larger orbital sizes. And uh, so on average, Neptune will take these objects and deliver them inward towards Jupiter. And Jupiter then flings them out, clears them out of the solar system. Or some of them get, 
trapped in the, in the Oort cloud by another uh, piece of physics related to the galaxy, the gravity of the galaxy and the nearby stars at very large distances. So this is the process by which the solar system got cleared out of small bodies. But in the process, you can see that, this is highly exaggerated, Neptune gains some orbital energy on average from trillions and trillions of these encounters. And, and uh, its orbit gets bigger over time. While Jupiter, which is doing most of the work in throwing the stuff out of the solar system, loses a little bit of energy, orbital energy, and its orbit shrinks. So in aggregate, by, by clearing out trillions of planetesimals in, the, in this process, uh, Jupiter and the in, in between two planets and Neptune, they drift apart, Jupiter moving inward and, uh, and uh, uh, Neptune moving outward. Now, Neptune moving outward means that the locations of its orbital resonances, where these orbital periods are three halves and twice Neptune's orbital period and other small integers, these locations also move outward. And uh, this is the process by which we think um, some of these uh, small, these Kuiper belt objects got shepherded into, uh, into these uh, resonances. And uh, we now have these pileups of resonances that we can see. Now, mathematically, there's a, there's a very interesting result that uh, by looking at the, these orbital parameters, the size of the orbit, which is represented by A, little a here, the semi-major axis I mentioned, eccentricity, and also the inclination relative to the mean plane of the solar system, there's a combination of these three orbital parameters. For each of these Kuiper belt objects, this combination is actually preserved as they uh, get shepherded into these resonances. And so today, if we look at these resonant populations, we can calculate this number and then ask way back in, pre in prehistoric times, in the early solar system when this clearing up process was happening, what was the location of Pluto? What was its orbital size? If it had a zero eccentric, a nearly circular, if it started out with a nearly circular orbit and a nearly coplanar orbit with the planets. So given this quantity today for Pluto, we can back out what its initial orbit was when it got uh, shepherded into, into this uh, resonant orbit. And looking across all the uh, resonant uh, Kuiper belt objects now, we can infer that Neptune must have migrated out by about 10 astronomical units. Okay, that's a fairly large distance. That's about a third of Neptune's size right now. Uh, to account for these resonant populations, this outermost planet in our solar system, large planet, would have migrated out by some uh, uh, 30, 50 percent of its orbital size now. We can also do further calculations and ask how much of this leftover planetesimal disk was needed to move Neptune by so much. And the answer turns out to be about twice Neptune's mass. So Neptune is about 15 15 to 17 times the Earth's mass, about a 30 Earth mass, total mass of these planetesimals uh, is needed to fuel this migration um, to the present configuration of the solar system, of the outer solar system. Jupiter moves out only about, also about 10% of its orbital size. Now we can ask what are other, so this is, you know, this is a theoretical, um, uh, you could say a hypothesis for explaining uh, Pluto and uh, the resonant populations. Are there other observations, other properties in the solar system that can uh, uh, give us more tests and constraints? Uh, so we looked at uh, the asteroid belt, and we looked, and I mentioned to you that there's even information in the crater impact crater record. You know, when we're flinging these, um, when we're clearing out this small body population in the early solar system, <coughs> some of them hit the planets. And some of the planets have very ancient surfaces. So we can go and look at uh, the evidence there as well. I'll come to that in a moment. But let's start with the asteroid belt. Let's look at the orbits in the asteroid belt. Um, this is, again, semi-major axis. And this is numbers now, numbers of uh, asteroids at different semi-major axes in the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt goes roughly from twice Earth's distance from the sun to about very close to actually Jupiter's orbit. Jupiter would be right about there. Um, but it's in this, narrow, in this narrow range of two to about three and a half times
times Earth's uh, distance is where most of the asteroids' uh, orbits are stable. And uh, this is what their distribution looks like. And you can see that there are some gaps. And these have been known for a while. They've been known uh, since the mid-1800s. Uh, Daniel Kirkwood was, uh, was an American astronomer in, uh, I believe, in Indiana. And uh, in the mid-1800s, uh, the first asteroid was discovered in 1801. Ceres, the, the biggest one. Um, and uh, over the next few decades, there were, by the time of the mid 1800s, there were about 100 asteroids that had been discovered. And Kirkwood noticed that in that, in that uh, distribution, um, the, there, were, there was an absence of asteroids with orbits that had small integer ratios to Jupiter's orbital period. Okay, so Kirkwood related these locations where there were gaps to orbital resonances with Jupiter. So an asteroid over here would turn three times around the sun while Jupiter did one orbit. And so these are these integer, small integer ratios. Um, incidentally, this is the current uh, distribution with about 1,000 uh, of the biggest asteroids we have in our collection. Uh, the number of asteroids in the main asteroid belt that we know of numbers in uh, the hundreds of thousands. Okay, so I've only picked uh, the hundred brightest ones because they, these, are, these represent the distribution, the underlying distribution uh, of orbits. If I were to add in all the hundreds of thousands of asteroids we actually know, um, there would be a lot of noise, so to speak, because those, there are asteroids uh, of comparable magnitude that we haven't discovered yet. The farther out we go, there's more observational incompleteness. So this is what we think of as a complete, observationally complete set of asteroids in the asteroid belt. And so now these gaps are called uh, the Kirkwood gaps. Uh, the Kirkwood gaps, we understood only, so since he identified them in the 1800s, it wasn't until about the 1980s that there was a theoretical understanding of why Jupiter's resonances create these uh, gaps. And uh, we, not, we now know that they're owed, owed to a phenomenon called dynamical chaos. Uh, these uh, gaps are actually the so kind of off-ramps in the asteroid belt where asteroids, uh, if any asteroid drifts into these gaps, it quickly becomes uh, a planet-crossing asteroid. It, uh, it can enter near-Earth asteroid space, so the, our near-Earth asteroid population is delivered through these gaps. The meteorites that we have on Earth, these rocks that fall, are also uh, coming to us from these Kirkwood gaps. And so here's a big question. Why are there gaps? in the asteroid belt, whereas in the Kuiper belt, we have these pileups. Okay, this is a question I get all the time. And it's only recently that I've come up with a nice way of explaining this. It's, it's actually kind of mathematically very complicated. So Jupiter is 20 times more massive than Neptune. Okay, Jupiter's mass is 300 times Earth's mass. Neptune is around 15 Earth masses. Um, Jupiter's orbit is also more elliptical than Neptune's is. Remember I said Neptune is uh, about as eccentric, its orbit is as eccentric as Earth's, which is only about 1%. Jupiter is more like 6 to 10% eccentric. Okay, so it's a little bit more eccentric. Those two factors about Jupiter, imply, may, what happens then is that these resonant waves that I talked about, we, if we can think about space being warped under gravity, under this, uh, the resonant uh, the places where there are these resonances with Jupiter, uh, the space is more chaotic because this planet is so much more massive and its orbit is not perfectly circular or circular enough that these uh, space warps are really chaotic. And that makes these resonant orbits unstable in the long term. So any asteroids that drift into these resonant regions on time scales of a, of a, of a few hundred thousand years they, they end up getting ejected from those uh, orbits, and so that creates these gaps. Whereas in, um, in the Kuiper belt, Neptune being a smaller mass planet, being more circular, those resonant waves in space are more stable. And so you get this, uh, uh, these pileups. Okay? Now here's an interesting, so when we look at uh, uh, how big these gaps are, there's an interesting problem that arises, which is that the Kirkwood gaps are larger than what can be accounted for by the current configuration of the planets. Okay, so, um, and it turns out that planet migration theory 
very neatly explains the larger gaps. The resonance has moved over time. So imagine Jupiter, Jupiter when it was a little farther away, uh, billions of years ago, uh, created this Kirkwood gap at these resonances where the resonances were located when Jupiter was farther away. So the resonances were a little farther away than they are now. As Jupiter moved inward, these resonant locations moved inward, and the gaps just got extended. Okay, so the, the, uh, the larger gaps that we see are actually consistent with Jupiter having been farther out. So that provides, us, provides support for that picture that I showed you about the planets uh, getting farther apart over time in the process of clearing out the solar system. Now we can also ask, when the planets moved, when they rearranged their orbits, and uh, there, these bigger gaps were created, where did the ejected asteroids go? And that's that connection with the impact craters on, uh, on the rocky planets. Okay, so most of the ejected asteroids will hit the sun. They're in the inner solar system. Uh, uh, they get, uh, the, the biggest target in the inner solar system is the sun. So most asteroids, as they um, get into chaotic orbits, they end up hitting the sun. Some escape into interstellar space by having these slingshots with Jupiter. And some hit the rocky planets. Okay, hit Earth, Venus, Mars, the Moon, and that's where we have a record of uh, the, the bombardment of, um, of these asteroids that were ejected from the asteroid belt during the rearrangement of Jupiter's orbit. So we have these impact craters that date back to some four, four billion years ago that we can see on Mercury, on Mars, and on parts of the Moon. Parts of Mars and parts of the Moon most of Mercury's surface dates back to about four giga years. Venus is uh, the exception. Venus actually has a very, geologically speaking, a young surface. It does not retain um, a memory of the impacts that happened four giga years ago because its, its surface has been volcanically resurfaced um, more recently. And of course, Earth doesn't retain much uh, memory of this very early bombardment because Earth is geologically active and these old impacts were erased under uh, weathering and geology on Earth. So, so some of these missing asteroids then uh, date back, or we interpret the heavily cratered terrain, the ancient terrain on Mercury and Mars and the Moon, as dating back to some four giga years. Uh, this was based on lunar samples as well as uh, crater chronology, counting uh, the density of craters, relative densi densities of craters on different uh, parts of Mars, for example, has parts that are very young, where uh, volcanism and other weathering processes have removed, erased old craters, and then there are parts of Mars that are really old and have, have a very high density of craters. So with these processes, uh, the, these ancient terrains on the rocky planets are dated to about four giga years old, and uh, so we can kind of uh, say that this process of rearranging uh, of the planetary orbits goes back to four giga years. We, are, we have a time stamp based on, the, on these old craters. Um, even on the Earth, we have some tentative, some, some uh, record of uh, bombardment going back to four giga years. These are fragments of ancient rocks that we find on Earth. These are called zircons. Uh, they are a few hundred micrometers in size. Um, a, a, a part of Australia has been a um, very um, uh, fountain of um, uh, these ancient, the fragments of very ancient rocks on Earth. Most rocks on Earth are typically, how old? We see rocks around us. Anybody know how old is a typical rock that you pick off of, uh, of the surface of the Earth? The average age, the, or the median, the most common age of rocks on the Earth is about 100 million years. Plate tectonics works on that time scale of, uh, of 100 million years or so. Uh, so finding rocks that are um, four bi billion years old is actually quite rare on Earth. There are small parts of continents, part of Australia, part of Greenland, part of the North American continent, very small fractions that go back uh, uh, as old as four giga years. So these are some fragments from uh, Australia that have been studied quite, quite thoroughly. Um, it's rare to find them. Uh, but we find so, there's a group in Colorado that's been doing this quite seriously, and they find this um, 
what's called an overgrowth on these zircons. Now, zircons are interesting because they're very hardy. They don't degrade as well, as, as easily as uh, other, uh, other minerals. And so uh, these zircons, they too, they grew, or they, these minerals formed uh, at 4.2 giga years, and then they show these overgrowths, this plateau that you see. This is time scale here. We are talking about age. The, the vertical axis here is age in, uh, I believe, millions of years. So this is 4,200 million years. That is to say 4.2 giga years. Here we have 2.5 giga years old. And so um, these, uh, these very hard minerals show, uh, some of them have been found to show these over, what are called overgrowths dating to somewhere around four giga years. Okay, so there was, there were, and this group interprets them as uh, uh, extra growth events possibly related to uh, thermal events that due to um, heavy bombardment by meteorites that went on at that time. Um, okay, so based on these fragmentary time, uh, time stamps we have on craters and uh, uh, even these fragments of rocks on Earth, it appears that the rearrangement of the planets happened about four billion years ago. The nice thing about it, the happy thing about this um, very hot, heavy bombardment on the planets is that the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt were decimated. The population, the population of small bodies in, in the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt went down by an order of magnitude, perhaps more, <coughs> perhaps by a factor of a thousand or so. So now we enjoy a very low flux of meteoroidal bombardment on Earth and in the inner solar system. So I think I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, with uh, going back to what I started with about Pluto, that Pluto has lots of company. It has five moons and it has uh, hundreds of Plutinos, perhaps thousands of Plutinos and KBOs sharing similar orbits. Uh, its orbit and uh, this pileup of eccentric resonant Kuiper belt objects, we now currently interpret it as, as being a, the smoking gun of ancient planet migration, which led to this rearranged solar system that's really stable and provides low um, meteoroidal bombardment uh, to us. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a happy state for life on Earth. And, uh, and I'll remind you that small, we are really interested in the small bodies of the solar system to learn uh, lots of big things and uh, how the solar system came to be, how, it's, uh, how it got to be arranged the way it is as we live in it now. Thank you, and I'll take questions. If you, you have a question for Renu, um, uh, I know the other hosts haven't been taking their privilege of asking the first question, because I'll be watching the videos online. <laughs> so I am going to take that uh, privilege. Renu, the, um, the, you mentioned at the start the orientation of Pluto's moons um, runs at 90 degrees to the ecliptic. What, is there any way to explain what's going on there? So I don't know a really good answer to that. Um, the total angular momentum in the Pluto system is of course, in the Pluto moon system, is a very tiny fraction of the orbital angular momentum. So um, moving the, or kicking the orbital um, orientation, or the, the, the spin orientation, if you like, of Pluto, uh, and any small bodies is actually not so uh, hard. And so one should expect random <coughs> randomness in the orientation of um, the spin axis of Pluto and these Kuiper belt objects. Uh, how random it really is would be interesting to know. So this is, this is one system we know that we can actually say how it's tilted. Of course, it, in that sense also Pluto has company. Uh, Uranus has a, also a similar tilt. The moon system of Uranus is similarly tilted, actually al almost uh, coincidentally similar, uh, 90-some 90, 90 degrees, 97 degrees or so. Um, so it's not unusual in that. You know, it's, it's random chance. But I think uh, maybe there's something deeper to it. If we have more data on um, the statistics of how the orientations of spins of Kuiper belt objects are, are arranged, you might be able to say that they're randomly oriented, or if there's a preference, it would be really interesting. I don't have a good, an good explanation for that, really. All right. 
How does the uh, total angular momentum of the Kuiper belt compare to that of Jupiter? Um, total angular momentum of the Kuiper belt. So the, at the current time, the Kuiper belt mass is a fraction of an Earth mass. Okay, so it's, uh, Jupiter really has the biggest angular momentum component in the solar system. Uh, it's very tiny. The total angular momentum in the Kuiper belt today is a tiny fraction of Jupiter's angular momentum. One of the uh, most interesting things to come out of the, the first uh, photos from New Horizons is that the surface of Pluto looks really quite young geologically, and yet, from what you're saying, there, there should have been lots of chances for uh, for impacts as, as all this scattering took place. You got a, any thoughts on why that might be? So, um, in the current environment, we think that Pluto, or generally in the Kuiper Belt, collisions are not so common at the present time. So, why are aren't they? Why why doesn't Pluto's surface look ancient? Uh, with lots of old craters and nothing, nothing very recent. This is fascinating. Okay. So um, I would say that um, this is indeed something to correlate with some other things we know about uh, uh, small bodies in the outer solar system. The moons of uh, Jupiter, uh, the moons of uh, Uranus, and uh, uh, Neptune. Neptune has also a large moon and some smaller ones. Um, the moons of Saturn. The, these icy moons seem to be able to stay geologically active far longer than planetary scientists have, have imagined. So either there's some component of energy uh, in, the, in the chemical composition of these bodies that we don't know about, or there are other physical mechanisms. Um, uh, having is it, is it important that Pluto has moons that's keeping it um, warmer? Perhaps. We don't know that this is a big puzzle that New, New Horizons has thrown thrown at us. I don't think it was predicted by by any planetary physics that we know of. Uh, Renu, I I've never been able to quite get my head around this, but how is it that Pluto and its other little Plutinos, how do they stay in the three to two resonance as Neptune moves out? Does it require damping? someplace in that system for them to stay there? Um, so I can give you a hand-waving explanation or I can give you a mathematical explanation. <laughs> so um, the hand-waving one is what I described, but you know, this is a, a new one to think about. There's a groove in space, okay? It's, it's, there's a potential well, and the potential well is just moving. And as objects fall into that potential well, they stay there. They don't care that the potential well is moving. They're happy to be at the bottom, at the, um, I'd say, in quotes, the low energy state. It's actually not a low energy state. Um, but it, it's, um, the other analogy I use is um, uh, if you have uh, uh, cracks in the floor and you throw dust around, when you sweep it, the dust gets collected in those grooves. And so when Neptune is moving, it's sweeping the space uh, out beyond its orbit, and these resonances are where the grooves are. So the small bodies end up collecting in those grooves. I can, I can give no you damping? a... No damping takes place in that? Well, I think when you're talking about damping, you're thinking that there's some energy that these small bodies are losing. There is, there is, no, there is no energy conservation here because Neptune is moving. Neptune's orbital energy is actually increasing. So it is not a conservative uh, process. There is energy loss and gain going on. It is, so you can think of that as, as damping, but it's not true damping in the sense of um, uh, what we usually think of an oscillator that damps to a small amplitude oscillation. It's not a damping in that sense. Okay, is Sharon known to have a precisely circular orbit about Pluto, or could it be slightly eccentric in which case both the tidal heating on both Pluto and Charon. So I think the upper limit on Charon's uh, eccentricity is uh, less than one part in 10 to the 4. So it is very, very eccentric, uh, uh, very, very circular. There's very little tidal heating going on. Although I was talking to Machia yesterday, Machia Chuk, who's sitting next to you, 
Um, he has some ideas of uh, perhaps obliquities, still producing tidal heating. Very high pump base to the middle. Right? right, right. So if the orientation, if the spin axis orientation is not perfectly, uh, if Pluto and Charon don't all have spin axes that are perfectly normal to their orbit planes, then tides can still sweep up and down above the equator. And that kind of tidal heating um, could, uh, could influence how young the surface looks. Uh, earlier this spring, Professor Batijan from Caltech uh, gave a talk about uh, new ideas of an earlier migration called the Grand Tack that more or less created the present inner solar system by, thing, by Jupiter and Saturn moving in and out. And uh, it, it's new, and d does its uh, uh, physics and, and the result of it uh, have an effect upon your theory, which takes place several hundred thousand, several hundred million years later uh, to explain the great bombardment? I don't think so. That's my short answer. I don't think <laughs> so. So the stuff that was left over from that is, is still, is yeah, still going to. I, well, the Grand Tech hasn't tied any, as far as I know. Uh, it's, it is new, so it hasn't been um, fully explored yet. Um, uh, it hasn't been tied to any of the l pieces of evidence, the observations that I described, you know, the, the asteroid belt gaps, the, um, the crater uh, record, um, the distribution of small bodies in the solar system today. There's no direct, direct uh, diagnostic, let me put it that way, for the Grand Tack that I know of yet, but it's still early. And perhaps that will be explored and we'll find some tie-in to the present solar system. So I'm wondering, how well do we understand the composition of the ice and its structural strength, and how long a crater would still be there and not slump away? Great question. Um, there's someone sitting next to you who can answer that <laughs> better than I can. Um, uh, ice at Pluto, uh, various ices, uh, the temperature at the surface temperature at Pluto is what, 50, 50 Kelvin, 70 Kelvin, something like about that. 40. Ice has about it's 40. It's about 40. 40 yeah. Kelvin. Uh, the, phases, uh, uh, the phases of ice at that temperature are um, not terribly well yeah. explored. Is that the right? ices you're looking at are carbon monoxide and nitrogen ices and possibly CO2 ice, all of which are very soft. And they may behave in ways like more like wax than like something you're f than like the water ice you're familiar with. So craters could disappear quite rapidly. I think that has to be considered possible. Yes. Yes. New Horizons is definitely resetting our horizons. <laughs> A couple more questions. How important is the exact mass of Jupiter and Neptune and their orbits? for their ability to clear out the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt? Great question. So if he had, if Neptune were as massive as Jupiter, this whole story might have turned differently, right? So the reason we have this kind of, um, this picture that I showed you where Jupiter and the other planets spread out like this, where Jupiter moves in, uh, Neptune and the other planets move, move outward, is because of this great contrast in the mass of, uh, uh, the, the lower mass giant planet being outward, being outside, and uh, the larger mass planet, Jupiter, being inside. If these were reversed, um, you, Jupiter, that lar large, the large uh, version of uh, Neptune, uh, would throw out uh, bodies out of the solar system and never transfer them inward. So, so this this dynamic of the process, the order in which uh, Kuiper belt objects or small bodies are cleared from the solar system would depend sensitively on the masses, not super sensitively, but uh, in the sense that you know a few percent changes wouldn't make a huge difference. But factors of a few contrast in mass between Jupiter and and Neptune would make a difference to whether or not the Kuiper belt objects ever drift in. You know, we get comets, the, uh, there's a class of comets called the short period comets, uh, which, which we think come from the Kuiper belt. That, that, uh, that population of comets we wouldn't have had Neptune been as massive as Jupiter. 
So these objects would never drift into to the inner solar system. They'd simply be thrown out uh, and escape the solar system before they ever got close in. Okay. Hi. So um, speaking of massive planets, uh, you, you talked about the Kirkwood gaps and that some of them went into the sun or the planets are ejected. Um, is there any relation to the former inhabitants of the Kirkwood gaps and the Trojan asteroids? Or are those simply left over from Jupiter's formation or some other unrelated process? Right, so um, used to be that we thought that these were left over from the time that the planets formed, that Ju as Jupiter grew, it simply uh, captured these or retained these Trojan asteroids. As, as its mass grew, the Trojan um, um, potential well in the gravity field of the sun uh, grew deeper and uh, trapped some number of the planetesimals that went into making Jupiter. The newer theory is that these were captured during this planet migration process. As the planets migrated, they, um, uh, the Trojan regions of the planets got repopulated by things like the Kuiper Belt objects. As the Kuiper Belt objects were scattered around, some of them got trapped in these tro Trojan regions. I, I didn't mention something. Uh, some of you may have heard of the uh, this uh, in, uh, possible instability of the giant planets as they migrate, they can run into resonances with, with each other. As their orbits are changing, they can, so Jupiter and Saturn can run into a resonance where their orbital periods are close to a small integer ratio, or Uranus and Neptune, or Neptune and, uh, uh, and Saturn, and so forth. And the planet, the big planets running into each other can, uh, run, run, not running into each other, but running, running into resonances with, with each other, can also create big uh, uh, dramatic uh, changes in their orbits. <coughs> and some of that uh, has, been has been speculated to, has been proposed as ways of understanding why the planetary orbits aren't perfectly circular, for example, are not more circular than they are. Um, I didn't go into that, and I don't think that's a huge piece of the, of the rearrangement puzzle. But, um, but that is an avenue we can also use as, uh, in, in ways to, um, to nail down more of uh, the details of how the planets migrated. For example, the Grand Tack model that uh, um, somebody asked about might leave some signatures in, in the, uh, the detailed uh, properties of the planetary orbits, how re relatively, how non-flat the, or the solar system is, or uh, how exactly how big the orbital eccentricities are of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, et cetera. Okay, if you have any other questions for Renew, and I know some of you will have some that you're not brave enough to ask on camera or on mic, um, please come up and talk to her after this. Renew, we're very happy that uh, you entered a one-to-one -one resonance with us today. <laughs> and we have this uh, mug. You're obviously going to need it um, to assist you. You've got a couple of aliens on there that uh, will probably <laughs> whisper to you about uh, things such as uh, how the how P Pluto ended up with such a youthly surface. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Rainy for <laughs>